Welcome to Dates and Dead Guys. Today, I want to provide a model for how each of us can find love. For inspiration, I look to a book called Black Elk Speaks, in which the author relates a story of a young Lakota man named High Horse in his attempt to court the woman of his dreams. I usually don't condone stalking, kidnapping, and murder, but the Lakota do things the old-fashioned way, so do with this information what you will. The Lakota are one of the subcultures of the Sioux people and live in the northern Great Plains region with other groups like the Cheyenne and Crow. Most of our story specifically takes place in modern South Dakota in the Black Hills during the middle of the 19th century. High Horse is a young Lakota man and he is in love with a beautiful young girl in his tribe. He has hardly ever spoken to her, but she is very pretty, so we can assume that she's a good person and she would make a good wife. As a Lakota man, if you want to begin courting a young woman, your choices are pretty limited. There are some traditions. He could, for example, play for her a courting flute. As you know, bull elk give off loud and impressive bugles to attract mates. They sound like this. And they are very alluring. The courting flute is played to attract women in the same way. If it gets her attention, they may move into a custom that translates to standing wrapped in a blanket, in which a man wraps himself in a blanket with an eligible woman in order to gain some privacy as the watchful tribe and her parents have no doubt taken interest. High Horse takes a different route. This girl's parents are very protective, so he can't be so brash as to flute for her. He loves her and needs to win her over, but he has to be cunning. He sneaks up to her teepee at night and waits for her to come out, but she doesn't. In the day, he waits by the stream where she goes for water and hides in the bushes. In the story, High Horse says, quote, And when she comes by, if no one is looking, that I jump out and hold her and make her listen to me. If she likes me too, I can tell that by the way she acts, for she is very bashful and may not say a word or even look at me the first time. End quote. It just goes to show, if a girl doesn't look at you or say anything, just keep trying. High Horse catches her by the creek, and he feels like it went very well. She didn't say anything. She might even like him. High Horse doesn't have much, but he needs to offer a dowry. He tells her father that he loves his daughter and he wants to marry her. He says he has two horses that he can give him, but without a word, the old man just waves him away. High Horse is crushed. He feels physically ill, but he doesn't give up. A friend of his offers to give him another two horses to increase the dowry. High Horse goes back to the old man and offers him all four horses, two of them young and the other two hardly old at all. But he's waved away again. He feels so sick he is going to die, but again he doesn't give up. He sneaks around more and finally gets the girl alone. He grabs her again and asks her to run away with him, but she says no. She would not do that. She wanted to be bought like a fine woman. The high esteem standards of the time. To be clear, I'm making fun of it because to modern American society, it sounds ridiculous, but culturally, this was very important to her. High Horse doesn't know what to do. He is more lovesick than he has ever been. He can't eat, he can hardly sleep, he can only get four horses, and the woman he loves will not run away with him. But High Horse has a good friend, his cousin, Red Deer. Red Deer can't stand to see his friend moping around this way, so he comes up with a plan. He says to High Horse, quote, She will not run away with you. Her old man will not take four horses, and four horses are all you can get. You must steal her and run away with her. Then after a while, you can come back and the old man cannot do anything because she will be your woman, end quote. For love on the Great Plains, kidnapping is an option. I don't know how long you have to kidnap somebody before they are technically your wife, but that's all just semantics. Red Deer adds, quote, she probably wants you to steal her anyway, end quote. High Horse is convinced, so they enact their plan. That night late, they sneaked up to the girl's teepee and waited until it sounded inside as if the old man, the old woman, and the girl were sound asleep. Then High Horse crawled under the teepee with a knife. At this point in the story, I was worried that our boy High Horse was going to kill her parents with the knife, but that's not why he needs it. The girl's father isn't a dummy, and he has seen High Horse sneaking around. Knowing that kidnapping, for love, is an option, he ties his daughter down at night with leather thongs to keep her safe. The plan is to cut her free, drag her out of the teepee, gag her, remember, this is for love, and throw her on a horse with her new husband-to-be as they hightail it on out of there. High Horse, in the teepee, starts cutting the thongs. Everyone apparently sleeps through this, but High Horse is struggling anyway. The thongs are tight, and when he cuts them, they make this popping noise. He struggles to cut one, his blade slips, and cuts the girl's leg. She screams, as one would, and alerts everyone within shouting distance. With one nervous cut, the plan is ruined. I once got so nervous on a date that I stopped at a green light. Another time, at a party, also nervous, I picked a girl up. Not trying to kidnap her, but then I accidentally dropped her through a table. Not as bad as knifing her thigh, but like High Horse, I did run away.
because I'm a man. Red Deer and High Horse do get a little lucky. It was dark in the middle of the night, so even though they were pursued, they were able to get away and no one knew for sure it was them. High Horse now feels so ill and lovesick that he just wants to die. He hasn't slept in days, he can hardly eat, but Red Deer comes up with another plan and says, quote, I am sure if you are man enough, we can steal her this time, end quote. It's not a wildly different plan, but they are making some tweaks. Red Deer has High Horse stripped down naked. He paints him solid white with black stripes down his body and black rings around his eyes. They did this to make him look like a water spirit. Red Deer tells High Horse that he looked terrible, scary even to him, and that, quote, if you get caught again, everyone will be so scared they will think you are a bad spirit and they will be afraid to chase you, end quote. The Winnebago, another group that spoke the Suian language, have illustrations of what this spirit may have looked like. In real life, it would be freaky. Other than the spirit paint, it is literally the exact same plan. So that night, they sneak back into the girl's teepee. High Horse crawls in with his knife, and Red Deer hangs outside with some horses, ready to gag her when High Horse drags her out. As he's cutting the thong she's tied down with, the girl's mother wakes up. It's dark, and she can't see, but she thinks someone is there. She tries to wake her husband, but he's not having it and falls back asleep. High Horse lays low and still, because he's not confident the mother is sleeping again. But eventually his mind wanders, and after days of restlessness, he nods off. Red Deer tries to wait, but hours go by and daybreak comes. He leaves as to so not be seen. The girl wakes up, and the first thing she sees laying next to her is a big white striped animal. She screams, everyone wakes up, and again a high horse has to run. He escapes down to the creek and hides in a hollow tree, but eventually those chasing him do give up, convinced the water spirit had returned to the creek. Red Deer sees the whole thing happen and has to pretend he doesn't know what's going on. It's like, what? Yeah, that was weird. Must have been some water spirit. Can't wait to tell High Horse. He must be around here somewhere. When the coast is clear, Red Deer goes and finds his friend. Despondent at failing again, High Horse elects not to return to the village. He says he's going to go on the warpath alone. The warpath really just means he's going to conduct a raid on a neighboring tribe. You know, to clear his mind and fight a little bit. Red Deer sees his friend is hurting, and he goes with him. I would like to say, although he doesn't have the best plans, Red Deer is about as good of a friend as I've ever heard of. I hope everybody in their life finds themselves a Red Deer. They travel for a few days, and one night at sundown, they come across some crows. The tribe, not the bird. Although, a group of crows is called a murder, which is ironic because they find a single crow guarding the horses, and they kill him. Scouts usually warn of coming raids, but they didn't see it because it was only two guys. This sounds very dark and uncalled for, but both of these groups would raid each other with high consistency. Black Elk talked quite a bit about how the Lakota were always on the lookout for crows conducting raids, and the Lakota did the same to them. After High Horse and Red Deer kill the guard, they steal all the horses, and there are a hundred of them. For three days they fled, driving them quickly back to their own village, and when they do, they stop the drive right outside the tent of the old man and the girl High Horse loves. High Horse walks right up to her father and says, Is this enough horses for me to marry your daughter? And then the old man smiles and explains, quote, it was not the horses that he wanted. What he wanted was a son that was a real man and good for something. End quote. And that's how High Horse wins the girl. Mm -hmm.